for me, happiness is not rainbows and unicorns. It's actually going to the science of it. What are your highs in life? What are your lows in life? And the lows are so important because every time you think about those lows and how crappy it was, it's understanding those low moments that gives you the fuel and a huge reminder that you'll get to the next high somehow because you've done it before. People are quitting in record numbers. And today's guest, Jen Lim, may know why. She is an expert at what makes us happy at work. And as the co-founder and CEO of the company Delivering Happiness, a company that she co-founded with the late Tony Shea, CEO of Zappos, Jen helps break down why right now is the time to relook at your purpose and passion. The inspiration is what inspires you as an individual. And doing the work, not the work to get paid, but the work within is actually the most impactful thing you can do. It is hard work. I call it the easiest hard thing you'll ever do in life. (laughs) I just love when we can actually be real with each other and see that authenticity and be able to say, you know, extrovert, introvert, doesn't matter. You are who you are for a reason. Purposes are meant to evolve because we are meant to evolve. So Jen, uh, I've always said that business and life would be so much easier if you didn't have to deal with customers or staff. Like, frankly, if you didn't have to deal with people at all, life would be so much easier. <laughs> Why are people, including me, so hard to work with? <laughs> well, you know, it's funny you asked that question straight off because I was just listening to a podcast and it was um, about it's called the way out is the way, is the way in the way out is in so essentially you know to the way out in this the world path is, is always to go through inward. the path is always yeah. through <laughs> right and what he said and this guy was like he became and this is an extreme case cuz not everyone's going to become a monk but he's basically a buddhist monk and he you know I think he started when he was in his teens. He was uh, a follower um, or a believer, a student of Thich Nhat Hanh, who recently passed away, Buddhist monk in uh, Vietnam. What he said was like, he kind of half jokes, it's like, when there's people, there's suffering. And that's how he sees the world. <laughs> and he laughed about it. But essentially, that just actually is so true. It sums it up. It's just like, we know that, you know, working with people, including ourselves, is not the easiest proposition because we know life is hard. And look what just happened in the last two and a half years. It's like insanely ridiculous, all the things that we had to endure as individuals and therefore society. So yeah, I think that's a good sort of outlook. Like it's hard (laughs) to work with people. (laughs) They're suffering. And of course, you, I mean, you spend your your career, uh, you were a consultant. I think you started out your career at KPNG and spent lots of time at Zappos. You're the CEO of Delivering Happiness. You're an author and speaker. And so like you've dedicated your life to like trying to make people's work life better, right? Like mm-hmm. whether it's culturally or whether you're working uh, to, to help people or even with your book, like it seems like your mission is like, how do we help people figure out how to live uh, happier at work? a happier Mm -hmm. career, a happier pursuit of their passions. And so I'm always struck with like, not only how hard it is, which, which you mentioned it is, but just why don't we seem to do this better? And and I'm the biggest (laughs) culprit. Like I suck at this. I really, as an entrepreneur, I'm terrible. (laughs) So I will be the first to say like, I suck, but, but why aren't we better at this? I, I think it's because the things that I talk about is just not rocket science. And Yet it takes a life of a lifetime of learning to actually incorporate these things of living more meaningfully, li- living with purpose, living with passion. Um, and it beca- and it has to be a practice. It's like a day to day practice of reminding ourselves that this is this is what we want. And if we look at the data, you know, like we spend at least a third of our lives in a workplace and yet most of the world is still miserable at work. And like the the latest thing we've been seeing is this whole quiet quitting. I mean, that mm. is a huge headline right now for a reason that people are just taking a stand to say, wait, maybe I do need to stand up for myself. What's What's quiet quitting for those who haven't heard of it? Yeah. So quiet quitting just came about like in the last few days and it became this sensation on TikTok. (laughs) Surprise, surprise. But essentially all these people started posting things about how they're quietly quitting. And essentially they're saying, I'm not going to go above and beyond what's being asked of me. I'm going to go specifically by my role, specifically by my contract. And I'm not going to expend more energy than that because I need to take care of myself. 
I need to have healthy boundaries. So it's become very controversial because in some ways you can see it from the perspective of the employee, but then for the employer, it's just kind of like, what the hell, you know, <laughs> like if people are quietly quitting and this is the key, they're not doing the great resignation. They're actually still quitting while they're working. So in a sense, they're not getting the most engagement. And that was a Gallup survey that was just done. This is the lowest engagement we've had over the last, since 10 years ago. And so it's become like a, a big, I think, point of, well, interesting point of discussion because we're seeing that people are, are actually trying to get better at it, trying to get better at realizing and focusing, hey, I actually need to do intentional things within myself, in my work day, in my life, so that I can actually feel fulfilled in my work. Mm. You know, that reminds me of um, our teachers union where I live used to do this thing called work to rule, which was like, we're not going to go on strike. We're just going to do I was going to say the bare minimum, but that's not even the case. It's like, we're just going to do what's in our contract and we won't go a stitch above. You know, we mm -hmm. won't do after school programs. We won't buy extra stuff. We won't mark things out of hours. We're just like, you pay us for these hours and this is what we're going to do. And that always um, mm. made me feel like uncomfortable, like uncomfortable with the idea because I think culturally, and I don't know if this is right or wrong. Maybe you can help me with this, but mm. I feel like culturally, like it's our job to like want to go above and beyond. If, mm -hmm. if I, like, I, I've owned an agency for 15 years. If I have staff members who are like, like, you know, oh, I start at nine, it's nine. Uh, oh, <laughs> I'm taking lunch now. Oh, it's five o'clock. I'm going to go home. Um, I'm not going to ever answer emails. I'm not going to ever be on my phone. And I used to tell them like, listen, if I'm calling you after hours, it's an emergency. because Otherwise I wouldn't mm -hmm. call. And so like I've always, I, as an entrepreneur, and many of us who are self-starters and entrepreneurs, we have this crazy work ethic. We have yeah. this crazy hustle. We have super high expectations. We're willing to do it. And so I just don't quite know how to work with people who don't also want to go mm. above and beyond. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I hear you. It's, uh, it's an understandable sentiment. It's kind of, kind of like, why am I working my ass off if this person is just kind of like, oh, okay, five o'clock, time to go. But I think what is um, the bigger sort of consideration here is the question of why, like why are people feeling that way? And it doesn't have to be like you're, you're an entrepreneur or like a CEO. It could be any single person in the world. It could be a custodian in a hospital, you know, like every single person has a different role in life. And the question becomes like, why are they not feeling this way that you're feeling? So I think we as leaders need to understand that and hit the root of this, that, that sort of, um, you know, I'm just, you know, trying to get by coasting kind of thing. And we as leaders really need to understand to how to create those conditions so that people feel like, yeah, I'm a custodian in a hospital. And this is a true story. This is the Northwell in, in upstate New York, where he actually shows up at work because he has a purpose. And his purpose is not cleaning up the rooms. It's his purpose is that he's there for the patients. And a great example is like one of the patients told um, in a survey, like he had an amazing time at the hospital and people were like, what the heck are you talking about? And his son's a doctor. And he says, because of this guy named Louise and he's the custodian. He said, Louise gave me a copy of the sports section every day I was at the hospital. And we talked about the meds and that was the highlight. And so Louise shows up with a purpose. He has the gusto of like, I'm not, not on a clock. I'm here to serve people. So I think that comes back to this whole thing about purpose. We hear this a lot, right? We talk about purpose, meaningful work, talk about passion. If we can create the conditions and actually ask people, what is, you know, your purpose? What it might be. You don't have to have a daunting, like, oh, save the world. You know, what is it that you want to change the world in you live, that you live? And that's why we're so big about purpose, so big about values. What is it that you want to live by and how? So I think if you dig to these deeper kind of intrinsic motivations within people, not extrinsic of job, I'm sorry, title, status, money, then people get a sense of like why every moment is so important to live fully and they'll see their whole work life differently too. Is this um, achievable? for everyone? Or is this kind of a Pollyanna approach to like, you know, very kind of Silicon Valley startup life can be awesome <clears throat> for everyone all the time. I mean, or is this yeah. something that actually is achievable for everyone? 
Well, I think that's why I brought up the Luis story. And I think, but I was just... listening to that story thinking, well, this guy sounds like a really positive, optimistic guy. And, and whether he's a custodian at a hospital yeah. or he's, um, he's, uh, you know, serving, serving coffee or he's, uh, the CEO of his own company. I have to imagine that he just seems, he just sounds like this guy who's just like a going to bring his full passion to whatever he does but but maybe i'm totally wrong about that um yeah i don't know if that would actually entirely be the case i don't know if if for example his work environment did not have the conditions where people were wanting and his leaders were saying we want to hear your purpose we want to hear your values we want to care we care about you maybe he would not show up that way and that applies for every every person every company in the, in the whole world so to answer a question like i'm a bit biased because I've seen it happen. I've seen it work in the way that, um, you know, even when basic needs are not met for that individual, somehow they can tap into their sense of, you know, existence, their sense of purpose, their sense of like, their reason, like that's like the reason for being. So I don't want to come across this whole subject matter as Pollyanna. Like that's, the worst thing. Like for me, happiness is not rainbows and unicorns. It's actually going to the science of it. It's the fact that we now know from an academic perspective, it's about having a sense of control, autonomy. It's about having a sense of progress. It's about connection, like deep connection. And of course, ultimately, most sustainable form of happiness is having that higher purpose. So why I think it is possible for everyone to get to this place if not necessary, because our time is so short on, you know, in this world, is that we just really need to have that reflection within ourselves. And so it's not about having this happy-go-lucky look, you know, and, and person that's like living their purposeful life. Hey, that's the inspiration. No, the inspiration is what inspires you as an individual and doing the work, not the work to get paid, but the work within is actually the most impactful thing you can do to say that everyone can potentially get to this place, but it is a, it is hard work. I call it the easiest hard thing you'll ever do in life because <laughs> <laughs> you can't compare it to Louise. You can't compare it to you. Like, obviously you know what you're doing. You're living purposefully, but what is it within you that really sparks you and really what brings you down too? got to be really holistic about not just our strengths, but also our shadows and being able to explore that with like embracing it is just so important right now, especially with well-being and mental health being such a big issue. What do you mean by that? I mean, I've, I've heard of the shadow self. I've heard others speak to it kind of, but what, what do you mean in this context? I mean that we all have sides of us that we may not have completely addressed and perhaps because it's so painful. Um, or things that we just sweep under the rug of like, oh, you know, that thing makes me feel icky. Why would I go there? And that's I totally understand it's human nature. But I think those are actually what's in, you know, what's in those closets, what's in those shadows are actually sometimes the most revealing parts of who we are inside. And revealing in the sense of if I can address those things, then I can actually live that much more fully. It's like not cliche when you say, uh, you got to hit your lows to hit your highs. It's like actually true. Because if you think about this one way, uh, we, we have an exercise called happiness heartbeats. It's talking about you're the star of your own show. What are your highs in life? What are your lows in life? And the lows are so important because every time you think about those lows, think about like what you were thinking, what you're feeling and how crappy it was. And then think about the next high that you were at that came eventually after. It's understanding those low moments that gets you, gives you the fuel and a, a huge reminder that you'll get to the next high somehow because you've done it before. So I think that's just a big reminder of like why shadow sides and, you know, our blind spots are so important in really, truly living a full life. I love that so much. I wrote it down. Star of your own show. I, I've been talking to my wife a bit about this because you know, at, at this point in our life, uh, I, I have four kids. She was at home with them for like 15 years before kind of yeah. stepping back into career and what have you. And I've like had to remind her like, hey, like if your life is a movie, you're the star of your movie. You're not like the best friend or the secondary <laughs> character or even the bad guy. Like, like this is, <laughs> this is your script. Like, how do you want this to go down? How do you want this to keep going? What do you like, what do you want to happen? And, totally. um, and it's funny because I think a lot of us are so used to like giving to the kids, giving to the partners, giving to the friends, giving to your parents, mm. giving to work, giving to 
the taxes, <laughs> just, mm-hmm. just like we just give to everyone all the time. Um, yeah. Most of us, I believe, are uncomfortable stepping into like, I am going to take responsibility. I am going to own that this is my life. Mm. Um, and, <clears throat> and I'm just going, you know, like what I've been struggling with the most right now is I keep thinking and saying like, this is life. I tell myself that. And I didn't really mm-hmm. pick it up anywhere, but I'm just like, this moment that's happening now, this is life. You and I, what we're doing right now, this is my life and this is your life. And yeah. after this, I'm going to go, you know, roast some chickens for my kids for dinner or whatever. Like, that's life. And if I'm not mm. happy with what's happening in this moment and the next moment and the moment after that and the moment after that, like, like this is all life is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, I, I, best, I guess I better change it or this is all life is. So, right. <laughs> like, like, release some things and just enjoy it a bit more. But, yeah. Um, I mean, there's so many things that come to mind when you say that. Well, number one, like, can I come over for some chicken too? Because that sounds delicious to have. Yeah. We're going to do some jerk chicken. Yes. Uh, for the people who like spicy, we're going to do some, uh, maybe some lemon salted chicken for the Ooh, others. <laughs> that sounds amazing. All right. Uh, let me know where you're at after this. Um, so yeah. And what you just said, I, I think about a couple of things. So one story and it's very close to me because I just did a documentary uh, uh, taping on this. And this is a woman called London, named London. And she said something so beautiful and eloquent that captures this time. She said, the whole world had to figure out what to do in a time of uncertainty. So I figured I have to do the same thing too. And what I love about that statement is like, she took it upon herself. She owned it. She said, you know what? No one's going to do this for me. So I figured I have to figure it out. And what she did she was working in social work before, and she said something very, very poignant as well. She said, I realized I was not healthy. And so she turned on her passion gears. And this might be one of those like too good to be true stories, but this is a true story. Turn on her passion gears and combine two elements of what she loves, which is art and shoes, like sneakers. And she made art out of like the emulating like old school, uh, old school kicks, you know, Nike and all that. And she was so successful. Like she started doing it. She was in in it. And within, and this is again, a really amazing story. Like within a week or so, she got a call from Nike after she started putting this out in stores, local stores, community stores. And Nike said, can we do this commission, this and this? And so, you know, like for those that are like, oh, that's great for her, but never happened to me. That's okay to say that. But just remember what she said, that she said, everyone had to figure out, the world had to figure out what to do. Now I have to figure out what I need to do for me. And that's what I love about that story. It's just like, just, she just took accountability for herself in a beautiful way. Now, with all the organizations that you work with, like the leadership teams, you've, you've worked with massive organizations and really small or companies as well. I, I feel like there's a dance between what the companies have to bring and what people have to bring, right? If you work for someone mm-hmm. else, if you're an entrepreneur, what you bring is the leader and what your team members bring to what you're trying mm-hmm. to build. What is the right amount of like <laughs> responsibility, let's say, like mm-hmm. as, as a business owner, is this all on me? And, if, and yeah. if you've read Extreme Ownership, you know that it's all of our responsibility all the time, but I'm not looking for that answer. <laughs> yeah, um, that's good because I'm not going to give that one. <laughs> um, I think, so when you say responsibility, I talk about this in my book, it, I call it accountability, but not in like the big brother, big sister accountability. Accountability, in my view, is being able to answer the question to anything that's going on to what's in it for me and what's in it for all at the same time. So then there's an understanding of like, oh, I'm doing this because this fulfills me for X, Y, Z reasons. And then it also fulfills the organization or the company or my team at the same time because I'm doing this. And it becomes a social contract essentially that we're establishing between whether you're the CEO or the lead of the man or managing the team or a person within the team. It becomes a complete contract understanding of here, this is what I'm here for. And this is how it's gonna benefit you, manager or employer or CEO. And this is how it's gonna benefit me. So I think it's shared accountability. And with that, it becomes less of like, you know, you're supposed to be doing this or you're going to be reprimanded. It's like, oh, I'm doing it because this is for me and for everyone. And uh, I, I just had um, someone close to me um, work, at, work at an organization that they were not happy at. And mm. it just, it just was like, there was like this gnawing feeling, but they didn't want to give up, right? Like they're, they're an achiever. They don't want to give up. They don't, they, they don't want to at all. But finally, it's just like, you know what? No amount of money, um, no amount of time, 
is just makes it worth it. I'm just miserable. So I'm going to stop mm. doing it. And then there was like this uh, period between jobs where they were really, really depressed and like hopeless and sad. But then the next place that they bounced at had more like a, like a four seasons model, I guess, in terms of like, like mm. leadership's job is to be there to support the team. Um, it's all very, very like, there's a lot of transparency. There's a lot of communications. It's always tied back yeah. to purpose. And, and I was like, see, it wasn't that you're not good. It's not that you don't have it. It's not that no one wants to work with you or you're difficult or anything. It was just like, it felt like a matter of alignment. Like mm. maybe, maybe this place isn't for you, but that other place is, and maybe someone who would go to that other place would hate it. And it's mm -hmm. about something else. And I don't feel like anywhere in school, anywhere in college, anywhere when I started working, or maybe even when you started working, did we actually figure out how to like find our cultural fit or even align with what we're looking for. Mm. You understand what I'm asking? Like, is there a way that we could get better at this without having to go through all the trouble of committing six, nine, six months, nine months, <laughs> two years, five years before we're like, oh, this isn't for us. Pull the, yeah. pull the shoot have to fire the staff member or have to quit. Yeah, uh, totally. And, you know, this is, uh, as you're speaking, it totally reminds me how, you know, with this great resignation, there's also a great regret, resignation regret that's happening. So about 40% of people that resign are actually looking for another job already. <laughs> so oh, all really? to say, I didn't even yeah. know that. <laughs> yeah. So all to say is just kind of like their initial reasons why they wanted to leave weren't maybe, you know, grass is greener, weren't maybe essentially the root reasons, the grounding reasons why they wanted to leave in the first place. So yeah, of course this is like very normal behavior, but I think the way to to address it is again going back to doing your own work within and by actually coming to an interview or before even clicking on the sites, job sites, actually asking yourselves those questions about like what means most for me and our deal breakers. And that we always talk about uh, on our side, at least purpose and values. If you have that going in, if they're not values aligned with that team or company purpose aligned with that team or company, it's an automatic, like, I don't think this is going to be fulfilling or serving me fundamentally in my core. And I think something really big to remember about this too is that another way to sort of not have to, you know, sacrifice five you know, months, six or seven or nine, you know, whatever, or a year or two in this whole process is again, doing that work ahead of and in advance, but also realize even like the best places to work, if you look beneath the covers, there are unhappy people there. And the reason being is like, this is just impossible for the Googles of the world to say everyone in this place is fulfilled and productive and engaged. So the key is, I think as us, as leaders and in, as an employer or employee is to actually really have those conversations from the get-go of that immediate team. Who are you going to be working with most immediately? And that's where that purpose and values alignment can be so crucial because if it's there's any mismatch there, it's a kind of a no-brainer. But then it also gives you room to say, yeah, I could be flexible on not having this because they are so purpose and values aligned. So no time is wasted because you're able to actually be more confident about what is it that you really want. And what is the best way for us to figure that out? Uh, you know, I've spent years... <laughs> stumbling through trying to be like, this is my purpose. No, this is my purpose. And, and mm -hmm. it feels like it's this constant thing that was always, that's always changing until finally I was like, oh, maybe it's this constant thing that's always changing because <laughs> I'm constantly changing. Yeah. Uh, how do we go about, I guess, version one of what our purpose yeah. is knowing it might change forever? That is exactly it. It's just like realizing that coming to, you know, that, that uh, aha moment that you had, it is, Purposes are meant to evolve because we are meant to evolve. If we're not evolving, that means something you know, from a Darwinian sense. So I think coming to also an acknowledgement that it doesn't have to be this daunting process. Like some people get super freaked out by hearing purpose, like, oh, sh like I don't have a purpose. I must be like some sort of loser. No, like we're not, not everyone or the, or has Or they think purpose. everyone else has this figured out and they don't. Yeah, and, and in the reality, behind. even if it seems like they do, they really don't. <laughs> because if you, <laughs> once, once you feel like you have it figured out, that means you're just, I mean, that means the rate of your growth is going to stop. 
And once you stop growing, there's no way to adapt in this world, whether you're a plant or a human being. So I think version one is exactly right. And that's why I you know, keep on going back to like what I talk about in the book is meant to be super practical in exercises of if you don't have one yet, or if you already have a purpose statement and you already have values, now is the time to revisit them. So much since 2020 BC before COVID has happened. And these conversations I'm having right now are people revisiting what those purpose and values are, which ones are still alive, which ones are still being lived and which ones like, oh, that actually is not that important to me anymore. So, and literally taking these statements, taking these values and looking at your calendar and seeing and being able to reflect at night and saying, did I live by that today? And if the answer is no, then how can, you know, how might I change my days differently so that it is more aligned with the core, the unshakable core of who I am. So I, I think that's basically the foundation of how to start about it, going about this. <laughs> I, I'm curious, what, what is your purpose? Oh, wow. I think it, the simple version is people, <laughs> connecting people. Yeah. The, I guess the more layered version is I believe that everyone has a light in them and it could be, uh, you could, I, I call it a pilot, like pilot light in my book because it's there whether or not you know it. And so my purpose is like to try and help everyone understand what that light might be. And cause it's like that core of what I'm talking about and be able to like, you know, I feel super grateful that, I mean, how the heck could I be in this role of delivering happiness? And now like, you know, more about fulfillment and beyond happiness. So like, I just really want to be able to connect these lights in meaningful ways. So it could be within a company or it could be just like down the street in, in my community or Starbucks, you know, I don't know who I'm going to meet one day or today. I just love when we can actually be real with each other and see that authenticity and be able to say, you know, extrovert, introvert, doesn't matter. You are who you are for a reason. So let's try to do something good together in the world. I love that. Did that purpose bring you to, you know, co-founding, delivering happiness, the organization, mm. and becoming CEO, and all of the ups and downs that's happened over the last uh, 10 years, 12 years, um, mm. And then that did that bring you to be to becoming a speaker? And did that bring you to writing, you know, the the, the follow up book, delivering happiness beyond happiness? And yeah. and is that like the thing that propels you, or are you making smart strategic decisions and then looking at them and saying, hey, does it align with my purpose? Yeah, um, I wouldn't say all my decisions are smart and strategic at all. So definitely. <laughs> Sometimes I look back like, what the heck was I thinking? Um, but to answer your question, you're like, was that my purpose at the beginning? Definitely not articulated that way. I feel like I refined my own purpose along the way as in, in the sense I got refined, refined my purpose, the more I got to know me and like being able to drink my own champagne of what I'm talking about with shadow sides and, and blind spots. That was like a huge humble, you know, hamburger of like, Oh, wow. Like just when you think you have this, this part figured out really reality is like, I don't. And I begin to have this, you know, beginner's mindset of just like, I have so much to keep on learning. So I think the purpose has evolved because like at delivering happiness, 2010, rewinding back when we were writing the book, um, working on and launching that it was like, I was so excited about, wow, we can actually change the way we work because we have Zappos as an example. But people back then, they were like, oh, that's all so cool and novel, but it'll never happen here. And I was just so fired up because I'm like, no, it can. Why not? You know, happiness is universal and it's scientific. And so I believe these concepts can be embedded. And so that's what got me fired up for purpose back then. And now fast forward to 2012 and then, well, sorry, 2020, I'm getting my dates mixed up. 2020 was when I started working on Beyond Happiness and the whole world changed. It did a 180 and the whole, I, I feel like as a reset on humanity, everyone had experienced, if not one, many sets of loss or pain or grief. And it's not just loss of a human being because of COVID, but also a loss of hope 
you know, a loss of sort of control of what's happening around the world, a loss of relationship or a job. So that really, really impacted my way of like, that's, I mean, I didn't even come up with the title until like weeks before, I think maybe days before the deadline. Cause I realized what it was all about. It's just like, I was focusing on happiness for so long, purposeful happiness, still very meaningful to me, but it really has to go beyond that now in a way that embraces everything about us as a human being internally, again, those highs and lows, but also how we interact with each other in that way, with that sense of empathy and understanding. Because I think really right now, the biggest thing is that people just want to be heard and understood. And if we can create that psychological safety in our organizations, and Google has proved with this Aristotle study that those are the most effective teams, psychological safety, that then I think that's, that's like the one of the best steps forward to get us back to a feeling that we have a sense of control and a sense of fulfillment. And so does that mean that, you know, if we're working in an organization or we're an entrepreneur or a team lead, Mm -hmm. I I heard earlier, you mentioned, you know, control. So people want control. They want autonomy. They want freedom to, to make some of their own decisions and work on their own. They want to be able to progress. So they want to be able to get better and they want to be able to know that everything has meaning to it, that, that that's not just meaningless. So they want purpose. Um, mm-hmm. Is it, You started off by saying like, it's really, really simple. Um, and I don't want to make it complicated. Is it just as simple as, as asking yourself either in your role or with your team, how can we find ways to give a little more control? You know, I heard, mm-hmm. I heard an entrepreneur say, your job as a leader is to be in charge, not control. And I'm like, oh, I love that so much. I don't know if I'm comfortable doing that, but <laughs> but, but like, we just yeah. need to give some more control. We just need to give some more autonomy. We just need to figure out ways to let people see that they're progressing. You know, like, mm-hmm. is, is it complicated? It it, it sounds hard. <laughs> Again, it, <complicated. laughs> it actually should. Yeah. Well, you know what it is. It's a. It's not rocket science, but it can be hard to go through the changes and the transformations and the you know. The steps to adapt, that that piece can be hard, but the th- way we think about it and analyze the situation and feel through things doesn't have to be hard. If anything, if we can acknowledge and just be open of those thoughts and, you know, like in those feelings of what can be done differently, that piece is the easiest. The actual doing, which is why most people don't do it, is the, the most difficult piece. And I just want to make sure everyone understands when I talk about control, because that means like, oh, you know, like type A personality, you know, this has to be my way or highway. That's not what I mean um, by any means. It's really like what you mentioned is about the sense of freedom. And part of what I talk about in the book is this is the adaptive age for me, because it's about controlling what we can, which is within purpose and values and embracing and letting go what we can't control. So that chaos that swirls around us, it's okay because that sandstorm can continue forever, but at least I know I'm in my tent, grounded in my, in, you know, in my safe place. So I just want to make sure that's like, it's not overbearing control. It's a sense of control. And as an example, like there's a, this receptionist at a doctor's office and this, uh, so I was talking about this um, topic of control at a, at a keynote, this guy came up to me and he's like, oh, I totally know what you mean by control. I love going to my doctor's office. I don't know. I keep on bringing up medical examples, but because <laughs> <laughs> cool. everyone has to go through life and death. Um, and he's like, I know exactly what you mean. Cause last time, and they're like, you know, who loves going to the doctor's office? He's like, I last time went up to the receptionist. She gave me her business card and on it, her title read director of first impressions. And that's why I love it. And she owns that role. She loves, she, she wants to be that director. And that's what I mean. It's a simple way to give a sense of control. Let them create their own job title because they want to be that person. And then make sure that it aligns with the rest of the team, you know, their, their role, the rest of the organization. See, these little things add up to big things because it comes to a sense of like, ah, I am being me. I'm bringing my whole self to work. You mentioned the adaptive age. In the opening of your book or, or in, in chapter one, you talk about the, the fourth kind of industrial revolution. The mm. idea that, you know, we were agrarian society that had to move into like machinery, that had to move into like assembly lines, that had to move into technology, that, that moved into the information age. I had never heard of the idea of the adaptive age. And so if, if you coined that, congratulations. <laughs> but, <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> but but um, uh, as someone who does not 
like uncertainty. None of us do. Mm. We all love certainty and we all love to know it's going to work and we hate risk uh, and we hate things that are out of control. Um, this term, the adaptive age, um, worries me. <laughs> <laughs> It, it worries me because it seems like, oh my goodness, things are just getting um, tougher and tougher mm -hmm. and tougher and tougher and tougher and tougher. Now, I mean, this is, we do hard things. So like we have to embrace a certain amount of hard things, but um, what are we adapting to in this adaptive age that we're entering into? Mm. It's exactly those things that you're talking about, like things that make you go, Ooh, you know, it's like you've heard of, I'm sure most, uh, I mean, some of you have on this, uh, have heard of VUCA, right? Like volatility, uncertainty, uh, complexity, ambiguity. That it was here, this term was like here, what, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. And then we all got a heavy dose of VUCA. And we just got to be real with ourselves in the sense like every day when we choose, if we choose to hear more sound bites, there's something else new that was totally unpredictable from the day before. And I think it's so important to think about as us as individuals, do that exercise of like in 2020 itself, all the VUCA things that happen. And that's just a snapshot of one year in time. So would we have that expectation that things will continue, continue vuca ing in ways that we cannot predict? That might make us feel unsettled, you know? So that's why I think it's so like a, so impassioned about why we need to ground ourselves so that we know what we're adapting to. Otherwise, we're going to like every news bit, uh, in a news bite that comes through the line, we're going to try to adapt to that, to adapt to that. But the reality is like the only thing we can actually adapt to is within ourselves. And one example, and I love bringing up nature examples in, in some ways, adaptive age is Darwinian. You brought that up in the different eras. Thank you, by the way, for reading the book. I didn't know anyone reads it <laughs> anymore. <laughs> I, I listened to it on Audible. You read it. Uh, it was amazing. I, <laughs> I actually had to audition for that, which is kind of crazy. I had to audition know. for it. I did. Yeah. They were like, like, oh, do you want to audition for it? I'm like, uh, yes, I think I do. So anyway, the, the I had to best, work for that. The best part, the best, I, and I, I, I mean this quite seriously. You're like, the book is read by the author. Me, it was like this like moment of like energy, and I was like, "All right, let's go." <laughs> yeah, because I I was shocked that I got the part, <laughs> so I was like, "Let's do this." And so I go back to uh, nature a lot, and one of the things I, I I learned about in the research for the book, and I have this metaphor and about like as leaders, we want to grow other greenhouses, and this is actually something Tony, my co-founder, and you know, one of my best buds. Um, used to say a lot is like, we as leaders want to grow and nurture other greenhouses. Don't be the biggest tree or biggest plant, but we want to create the conditions for growth. And I totally was into that. What I had to do and process during the writing of this book was, as some of you may know, like Tony passed at the end of 2020. And so for me, that was a big metaphor of what was missing in that statement. And the build was yeah, of course we want to nurture other greenhouses. That's what we want to do as leaders. But what we often forget is to nurture our own at the same time. It's like the whole oxygen mask thing, right? Very cliche, put it on first, hard to do, very uh, like counterintuitive. And we forgot, maybe because we didn't fly for like two and a half years with COVID. But we just have to remember that. And that's where I think uh, adapting comes from. You look at the sequoias. Have you been to Bay Area sequoias? I've 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 never been to California. <laughs> what? Oh my gosh! Do I need to? I flew into LAX once, and we spent two hours, and we got like an oh, yeah. eighteen dollar Corona. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that really does not count. <laughs> does not count. No, not at all. I won't even count it. <laughs> and that was LA too. So Bay Area is another place. But um, maybe I'll make some other form of chicken for you to invite you over. Ooh. But um. So sequoia is like one of the tallest trees on the planet. Beautiful redwoods here too. But you walk in those in that setting and it's like majestic, you know, like you look at of these trees, you're like, how did this get here? And it's an example of adapting because what's really interesting is that even though they're the tallest trees in the world, they have like the shortest root systems. And the only reason why they're able to grow and withstand things like fires and other like natural disasters is because they're all interconnected. Their root systems are so interconnected, they actually help each other out when someone, like another tree, someone, a tree is missing sap or missing water. They actually support 
that tree. What's interesting also is they, uh, some scientists put some dye in one edge of the forest. And a few years later, they found the same color dye at the other end of the forest. That's how interconnected they are. And I really hope that dye was, you know, organic because that would really suck <laughs> if it wasn't, but they're still around. So this is all to show like what we can learn from those that those, you know, ecosystems out there that can adapt. And I think us as human beings really need to get back to those roots of like, how can we learn from that and apply it to ourselves as an individual, our own greenhouse, also our teams and our company is a greenhouse too. I've struggled to articulate. I was talking to someone this morning, really early this morning, and they were asking me questions about like being in the, my 20s or something. And they were mm. like, remember when you were like 24? And I was like, I- I'm turning 30, I'm turning 40 this year. So it's like, congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I don't want to. <laughs> Thank you. No one's congratulated me yet on turning 40, but uh, <laughs> it's an achievement. It um, is. It's gross. But, but um, you know, I was, I was thinking about that. I, I just finished reading Brian Wilson, the lead singer of the Beach Boys, his biography. Okay. And oh, he had okay. like a ton of his hits. Like he was like 20, 21, 22, 23, 24 in the 60s. Made lots of music and then kind of really um, uh, had some, some mental health issues. Mm. And, uh, and he was in like at 45 in the late 80s talking about being 24. And here's the struggle I have. I have changed so much for my 20s and my early 30s that one, I, I don't even like reminisce. I don't go like, oh man, I wish I could go back to being that way because like I'm better now. Like I'm better yeah. in so many ways, health-wise, mindset, less anxiety, less stress, less focus on achievement. Mm. Um, and that's, uh, that's amazing. The See, same, congratulations. Well, <laughs> 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 thank you. But the same challenge is true for me pre-COVID and post-COVID. Mm-hmm. I, have, I have changed so much. I think we all have. There's no going back as much as mm-hmm. anyone might say like, I'm just holding out because I can't wait to go back to the way things were. They're not going to go back. but I don't know if you or even the people that you connect with, it's like, there's almost like this, I struggle to try and grasp onto whether what we're doing right now is like mm-hmm. back to like, quote unquote, real life. And like, mm-hmm. we're supposed to be back to the way things are supposed to go. Or if we're still in this like weird bubble of like pandemic COVID and everyone's kind of like, and we're kind of just like chilling. Like, I don't, I don't feel like <laughs> I have my feet on the ground and I know that mm-hmm. it's like the race has started and let's get back to it or not. I don't know how to articulate the changes that have happened over the last few years. I don't know how to think about what happened before and what happened after. Maybe I just need therapy, but but, <laughs> but, but surely we're all like experience this kind of feeling of like, mm. it's like uh, trying to grab smoke or something. It all just kind of floats yeah. away. Yeah, totally. Uh, like I, what instantly came into my mind is that you're not the only one. <laughs> feeling oh, this way. <laughs> I mean, Ooh, I was so worried I was the only one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Mark, you're special, but I'm sorry to say you're not the only one feeling this way. And the thing is, though, that the difference of you is that you're acknowledging this weird purgatory we're in of 2020 BC. And we're not even AC because we're not after it. It's still around. It'll be here forever. So what I what I'm trying to like point out and commend and congratulate you on is that you're acknowledging it. You know, that's like a huge, big big piece of this. And so like a survey that was just came out, Gallup's uh, global state of the workforce survey came out earlier this year is showing that these levels of stress, anxiety, um, depression uh, is still at an all time high compared to, you know, every successive year since 2020. And what the, the results is suggesting and really showing, and I think I've seen it and feeling it in my conversations is that because people have not processed what's happened in the last two and a half years, Mm -hmm. they're kind of like, yeah, let's get back into the saddle again. Let's get out of this. I can't get wait to get out of my house again, start traveling, doing all the things like what, like we used to do, but the reality, and you said this, we'll never get back to where we used to be. It's just not, so, I mean, the world has shifted. And if we don't recognize that, then there's something, again, we're not going to grow and we're going to get stunted. Um, but I think that's a big part of why I talk about the greenhouse and why I think it's so important to revisit our purpose and values in this time, because it gives us you know, a, a tactical, practical way to stop 
and actually reflect like what really did this do to me and that's why the shadow side is important too like what am I kind of like you know sweeping under the rug that I'm not really acknowledging because is there something that's driving this sense of anxiety or you know yeah you know this quiet quitting in me or whatever it is so I think we're going to have to still keep processing. And what I love about this particular time that's very different from 2020 BC is that now we can talk about these things more openly. You know, Simone Biles did the world a favor. Uh, Naomi Osaka, their workplace happens to be on an international stage, but, you know, we're all the same. Like they took a stand and probably in the hardest predicaments ever working for this Olympic moment. And she said no. And of course, people plotted for her heard for that, but there are a lot of haters too. And I think that's kind of how we kind of look at our own decisions. Some people will applaud us for it and probably some people will be very against it, but at least we know we're understanding ourselves, understanding the world and being able to adapt based on what's most core and meaningful to us inside. Ah, Jen, this has been such a remarkable conversation. Um, as we close, I just have, I have one final question for you. And it's yeah. something that I like to ask of everyone, because honestly, I feel like it always gets to the heart of the matter. But um, so the question is for you at the end of the day, what does it mm. all come down to? Uh, might be too much of a cop out answer because it's down to my purpose of people. Uh, but my ad and my build to that, especially in the last two and a half years, is that people includes myself as, as that part of that equation. Like, did I treat my people as best as I could today? Including the people I love, the people at my work, my clients, but also myself. Beep.